Welcome, everyone. My name is Jesus Rodriguez. I'm the editor and founder of Orinoco Tribune, orinocotribune.com. And today we have the pleasure of having uh, U.S., almost Venezuelan, Professor Steve Elner and, uh, with us, and we will interview him about several issues, mostly uh, related to Venezuela, but also related to worldwide events. Um, but first, before... Uh, giving the mic to to steve i'm gonna read uh, his short bio uh steve elner has taught social science at the universidad de oriente in puerto la cruz venezuela for over 25 years he undertook uh, a few years later uh in the same university research projects he saw political science uh, for five years at the central university uh in venezuela uh, he was editor, uh, he is actually, uh, sorry, he was visiting professor at Duke's University and currently he is associate managing editor at the theoretical and scholarly journal Latin American Perspective. He is co-editor uh, of several books, among them Venezuelan Politics in the Chavez Era, Class, Polarization and Conflict, uh, the Latin American Left from uh, from the... From the Fall of Allende to Perestroika, he is author of Venezuela's Movimiento al Socialismo, From Guerrilla Defeat to Electoral Politics, and Organized Labor in Venezuela, 1958-1999, Behavior and Concerns in a Democratic Settings. He also uh, has published several articles in the op-ed page of the New York Times and Los Angeles Times. So welcome, Steve. I don't know if you want to say a few things before jumping to the questions. Well, just that I want to, you know, thank you for the invitation. Great, Steve. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Uh, uh, I actually uh, initially saw about doing this interview with you when I read your piece uh, about the about the material conditions in Venezuela and this controversy between the Venezuelan Communist Party and the, and the Maduro government and Chavismo. So, but today we are going to talk about that, but also about several other issues. So I'm going to jump to the first question. Okay. Can you tell us your opinion on the Monroe Doctrine's victories and defeats? And how does it operate in the rising multipolar world? Uh, and I ask you this also, uh, I mean, because uh, recently uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in his UN speech met, talked about the Monroe Doctrine, but uh, in a way that was very interesting to me, he he's basically said that the U.S. are trying to internationalize uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Monroe Doctrine. What do you think about that? Well, uh Firstly, uh, I think it's important to point out that in circles in Washington, there is some discussion as to whether the Monroe Doctrine is still applicable. Uh, I personally believe that the discussion uh, really boils down to the good cop, bad cop duo, in that uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, the Democrats who represent more of a soft line position in terms of their discourse, and the Republicans, or especially the neocons, who play an important role in the uh, formulation of policy in, in the Republican Party, they represent more of a hard line. But in practice, uh, they're on the same page. Uh, and just to give you one example of that, or one proof of that, uh, you know, the most important position in the Congress with regard to foreign relations is the Senate Foreign Relations Committee president or chairman. Uh, and that's Bob Menendez, who's a Democrat, but everybody says that he's really Republican when it comes to foreign policy. Why, why do the Democrats, if they really are intent on projecting a different line with regard to the Republicans, why do they choose somebody like Menendez, who uh, incidentally is now under a lot of pressure to resign as a result of blatant uh, acts of corruption on his part? But that's, that's another issue. Why do the Democrats appoint somebody like him to occupy the key position in Congress? Um, the hardliners represented by the neocons, uh, say, as John Bolton, uh, who was a national security advisor under Trump, said, 
uh, we're not afraid to use the phrase minority doctrine. So they're upfront about it. But the uh, Democrats um, claim that the Monroe Doctrine is no longer a U.S. policy. And that, that was stated uh, explicitly by Jan John Kerry in 2013 when he was Secretary of State. And if you read what he says, basically what he says is, we are not acting alone. Our new policy is to consult our allies. So we're not promoting unilateral intervention. But he doesn't renounce, or the Democratic Party is not renouncing intervention per se. Um, so really, there's very little in the way of difference there. But even, even with regard to what Kerry said, um, you know, under Obama, the sanctions against Cuba were not list, lifted. Now, you might say that that's not uh, the Democratic, the fault of the Democratic Party, maybe it was due to the Republicans. But as I said before, Bob Menendez, who's a Democrat and the most important Democrat in Congress with regard to foreign policy, vehemently supports the sanctions against Cuba and, and Venezuela. And, uh, you know, under Biden, the sanctions against Nicaragua have been actually intensified. They're now applied to areas such as mining, uh, exports, imports, investments in a bigger way than before. And I think that the best proof of, of all, if Kerry is saying that we are no longer intervening unilaterally in the affairs of other nations. We're intervening in the affairs of other nations, but we're not doing it alone. What about the case of Cuba? In the United Nations, the you know, overwhelming majority of members of the, national, of the Assembly, the General Assembly of the United Nations, year after year, vote against the sanctions, censoring the sanctions against Cuba. And, the, and yet the United States does not lift those sanctions. Uh, so that this is proof that really nothing has changed under Obama, that the differences between the Democratic and Republican Party when it comes to, to the Monroe Doctrine is a difference of wording, but not a difference of substance. Now, uh, with regard to the issue of a multipolar world, um, you know, uh, and, and, and with regard to the statement, with regard to Russia's position on the Monroe Doctrine, I think that there is a clear polarization in the world with regard to interventionism and with regard to foreign policy in general. The Russians and the Chinese uh, are opposed to uh, intervention. They, in their discourse, they emphasize the term national sovereignty and a multipolar world. That becomes a slogan, that becomes a key uh, term and their official policy, and as well, as well as the application of that policy. The United States position is that of the R2P. R2P is responsibility to protect. In other words, in the world, in the world of globalization, the idea of national sovereignty, which dates back to the Treaty of Westphalia um, in 1648, a treaty that stated that, you know, each country or each province, in the case of Germany, which was still, you know, consisted of different uh, kingdoms, uh, the prince of each kingdom, in the case of Germany, would decide whether their kingdom was Catholic, or, that is, Roman Catholic, or Protestant. And that, that really set the tone for the concept of national sovereignty. Each nation decides. Um, in the age of globalization, the discourse of a lot of writers on globalization and the discourse of, you know, the formulators of U.S. foreign policy is that, well, what I said before, the R, R2P, the responsibility to protect, that the world is different. The world is smaller. The world is interconnected much more than before. And therefore, um, you know, things have to be different. Uh, each country has to uh, take into consideration what, what other countries say and what other country, countries demand. That's fine at the level of discourse if every country follows that policy, but the United States doesn't follow that policy. Just take the case of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. The United States uh, didn't sign on to the ICC. And under Trump, under Pompeo, Mike Pompeo, uh, the prosecutors of the ICC that were investigating war crimes in Afghanistan and Palestine were sanctioned. Well, B Biden lifted that, but the refusal to belong to the ICC 
is based on a discourse that really demonstrates that the idea of national sanctions, you know, do as we say, not as we do. The United States says that we can't be a member of the ICC because that way there'll be criminal charges lodged against U.S. citizens committing crimes in U.S. territory, and that's a violation of national sovereignty. But the United States doesn't respect national sovereignty when it comes to Venezuela, Cuba, and so many other countries. Um, the same thing with financing of elections. Uh, the United States pours a lot of money into campaigns, electoral campaigns in other countries under the idea of this is a different world. The world is smaller and each country has a right to basically uh, have a say-so in the internal affairs of other countries. And yet the United States, uh, there was a big scandal because of Russian money supposedly uh, injected into the uh, electoral presidential electoral campaign in 2016 and 2020, which was really just a drop in the bucket. But that became a big scandal because it was a violation of national sovereignty. So the list goes on and on. But basically, you have a clear cut divide between the discourse and the practice of the United States when it comes to national sovereignty and that of Russia, that of China, and a good part of the global south. Yes, that's true. I agree with you with that. Uh, and uh, now I'm going to ask you about, um, I'm going to ask you this. Let us know exactly what you mean when you talk um, about war against Venezuela. What are the similarities and differences with other regime change operations or with other political internal struggle in Latin American countries? And this term, is, uh, I use war against Venezuela because you use it a lot and you use it in the piece that I mentioned before. And the name of the piece is Objective Conditions in Venezuela, Maduro's Defense and Strategy and contradictions among the people. That's the, that's the name of the piece uh, that I was talking about a few minutes ago, and you published it um, a few weeks ago in the Science and Society uh, magazine. So what do you mean with the war against Venezuela? Yeah, uh, you know, it seems to me that if you compare U.S. interventionism uh, and the strategy and the tactics used by uh, internal forces on the right, uh, in many cases in cahoots with Washington. You compare that with other Latin American countries, the same thing is going on elsewhere. There's no question about it. I'm not saying that Venezuela is an exceptional case in that sense, but in terms of intensity, uh, there's no question that Venezuela stands out. There's an ongoing destabilization uh, in favor of regime change uh, in Venezuela. And, you know, it goes back to, if you, you know, you just list, list the examples, uh, the 2002 coup against Chavez, the 2002-2003 general strike, which was really not a strike, it was a, uh, it was a no lockout mm -hmm. on, the part, uh, on the part of Fede Comitas. Um, and then after that, you know, street protests, uh, with the effort to destabilize and bring about regime change, the so-called Guarimba in 2013. The, the U.S. Office of Transition Initiative, uh, it, which was set up shortly after the coup in 2002. Well, transition in the language of U.S. political scientists and in Washington means transition, means regime change. I mean, that's a euphem euphemism for regime change. And that was an office that was set up it's set up in countries with failed states, um, but not in Latin America. Venezuela was the only case that I know of, at least, in Latin America. Um, uh, and the only case where you have a country where, where, you do, where you don't have a failed state, you don't have the kind of situation perhaps in, in some other countries like in Africa, uh, that the United States set up this uh, office of transition. The, the cable gate documents of WikiLeaks demonstrate the degree to which U.S. diplomats undertook a policy of trying to uh, undermine all Venezuelan foreign policy initiatives. Um, the uh, Brazil was, they tried to convince Brazil to engage in espionage against Chavez. Uh, they put pressure on the Russian government to refrain from selling arms to Venezuela. It was an ongoing effort 
uh, against the Venezuelan government. The border violence from Colombia and more recently the invasion of paramilitary forces from Colombia, uh, the role of the church and uh, the labor movement and business organizations, you know, separately, okay, but it's very uncommon that organized labor and the business sector work together, uh, hand in glove, to bring about uh, a, a regime change or change a policy of any sort. Uh, and yet that happened with the 2002 coup and the so-called general strike of 2002-2003. Um, wh why was this happening? Because the U.S., saw Chavez as a threat way above that of any other head of state um, because of his charisma and because of his appeal uh, at, the, at the world level. He was a world leader more than any other leader in Latin America, at least at the time. Um, uh, when Chavez traveled to all the OPEC countries um, in 2000, in order to invite them to the OPEC second summit, in Caracas in September of 2000 um, in order to establish a policy of prices that fluctuated between 22 and 28 dollars I believe it was. Um, th th this, this was viewed by Washington uh, as a different kind of threat to U.S. hegemony. Um, and so I would say that in 2015 or in 2000, actually in 2013, when Chavez passed away, um, the tactics that were used uh, reached a new threshold um, against Maduro. And that happened because they saw Maduro as, as weak. Um, they uh, realized that Maduro didn't have the charisma that Chavez had when the elections took place in 2013. Uh, Maduro won by only 1.5% of the vote. Uh, and then after 2015, you had um, inroads by the right, beginning with uh, Macri, who won the elections in Argentina, the national uh, uh, elections, the National Assembly elections in Venezuela in December of 2015 that was won by the opposition. Morales lost the um, referendum in 2016. So there's a series of defeats for the so-called pink tide. And that's why there was an escalation of tactics uh, against Venezuela. Again, if you compare Venezuela with other countries, there really uh, is little in the way of comparison. So I would date the sanctions against Venezuela and this new threshold, uh, this threshold um, in which there was an intensification of hostility against the Venezuelan government, I would place that date at 2015 with the Obama uh, executive order declaring Venezuela a threat to U.S. national security. Now, that's a big thing. I mean, when the president of the United States says that another country is a threat to the national security um, of the country, that uh, can't be minimized. And after that, there were a number of U.S. companies that left Venezuela, Kimberly Clark, Clorox, Pirelli, General Motors, Kellogg's, one after another. They left Venezuela. They claimed the conditions, economic conditions, uh, were not uh, uh, propitious for, uh, uh, for you know, uh, making a big profit. But obviously, the executive order of Obama had a lot to do with that. And I think that that's an important uh, issue because the opposition in Venezuela tends to say that the sanctions were implemented in 2019. That's when the sanctions um, prohibiting countries from buying Venezuelan oil. Th those were the, uh, the worst sanctions. But sanctions were also implemented in August of 2017, uh, uh, Trump's first year in office, uh, which uh, really uh, sabotaged the Venezuelan oil industry. There's no question about that. There were financial sanctions that didn't allow uh, U.S. financial institutions or financial institutions anywhere in effect to refinance, to allow Venezuela to refinance the debt. Take into consideration that in 2015, the price of oil began to nosedive. And in any kind of situation, a company that's facing a difficult situation, they refinance their debt. Their debt. This is uh, a, a common practice. And yet Venezuela, PDVSA, the state oil company, wasn't allowed to do that by Washington because of those sanctions. So I would say the sanctions go way back. 
to 2015. And that's yeah. when the situation in Venezuela deteriorated. The discourse, the narrative of the Venezuelan opposition is that Maduro is to blame for the economic situation because those sanctions were only implemented in 2019. That's false. They go back to 2015 with Obama's executive order and then the financial sanctions against PDVSA in 2017. Um, so uh, there's a book that I want to recommend. It's called Extraordinary Threat by Joe Emersberger and Justin Podur um, that really documents the kinds of intervention at different you know, uh, levels uh, diff on different fronts uh, that really crippled the Venezuelan economy. Um, we interviewed them when they launched the book. Very good, very good. <laughs> yes. That book uh, is uh, very good. I, I uh, reviewed it for a uh, U.S. journal, uh, and I liked it very much. It's very well documented. So, um, you know, the, the list really goes on in terms of the types of intervention, uh, the types of threats, uh, Trump uh, called on the Venezuelan military to overthrow um, Maduro, uh, all kinds of um, sticks and carrots that were thrown out there, threats, but also um, incentives to try to convince the military to overthrow Maduro. That really uh, puts Venezuela in a special category. So that, that's the point that I'm, uh, I'm attempting to make. But in addition to that, I believe that the defensive strategy that Maduro uh, carried out, uh, the kind of strategy, and we can go into that in detail if you like. Yes, uh, there's a question that, about that coming. What's that? There's a question about that coming. Okay, good, good. Yes. Because really what I mean to say is uh, this article that I published in Science and Society, a, a US journal, uh, incidentally, a journal that that goes back uh, nearly a hundred years, uh, yes. a century, and it's Listen. a, a Marxist Listen. journal uh, that published this article of mine in in the July issue. I talk about objective conditions, which I really just mentioned, uh, but they're also subjective conditions, and that is that uh, the rank and file of the Chavista movement is, is to an extent uh, demoralized. Those are subjective conditions that also have to be taken into consideration. And that's valid. That's exactly what Marxism uh, and the left has done you know, throughout history. Uh, and so uh, that is, those are two factors that really stand out, subjective conditions and objective conditions. Listen, listen, but going back to wars against Venezuela, <clears throat> I believe that it's extremely important that you try to coin that term because... <sighs> Mm, I believe, I have the impression that a lot of people outside Venezuela in other countries uh, tend to compare uh, Venezuelan recent uh, struggles with their own uh, mild, some in most cases, you know, struggles. And that, in my opinion, tend to make them believe that sometimes radical decisions taken in Venezuela are too radical according to their standards. But I believe that they ponder that radicalism based on their own, you know, country experiences. And they don't, not, don't really uh, measure what has been really happening in Venezuela. And besides all the things that you mentioned, I mean, we have to say that we have a, a coup opposition that has been plotting coups almost every six months since Chavez took power. And and, and no one talks about them. I, I mean, no one pays enough attention to that. So I believe that that's why I believe uh, that you you are trying to coin this war against Venezuela concept because uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what happened in Venezuela. I, I but, agree. I but agree 100%. I, but I'm going to jump to the next question and eventually we'll, we'll, we'll uh, go into this uh, mm -hmm. issue of the objective condition and a strategic retreat. Uh, but the third question is this one. In your opinion, how Marxist-Leninist, and that's a question that, you, that was you were talking about, a strategic retreat, 
or the Spain's anti-fascist popul popular front relate to the recent controversy between PCB and PCB is the Communist Party of Venezuela and the PSUB that is the royal party here. Uh, that goes exactly to what you were about to say. Yeah, yes, I, I believe that there are historical parallels. And I mean, that's what history is all about. Why, why, why do we study history? Uh, in part, because we want to learn from the past, or at least, I mean, we're not going to really have a blueprint as to what to do, but there are parallels that give us uh, uh, an idea of what direction to move in. Uh, and, you know, the um, uh, case of the Popular Front against fascism, I think, is one good example in which, uh, you know, the, the communist movement uh, that was organized uh, in the form of the Comintern, which was the international communist movement, you know, back in after the Soviet Revolution, the left was almost the communist movement that changed in the 60s um, when I became active in the 1960s against the war in Vietnam. But before that, uh, the left tended to be very heavily influenced by the Communist Party. In the common turn, uh, after the clan, at the time of the crash, uh, the stock market crash of 1929, um, they went into what's known as the third period in which they believed that the time was ripe for revolution uh, and that the economy, the capitalism was weak and that anybody that was not willing to um, participate in the revolutionary struggle was on the right. And they called the social Democrats social fascists, which was really kind of absurd uh, because they're, they're the reformists, but they weren't you know, fascists by any means. Uh, and if the communists in, in Germany had allied with those uh, so, social Democrats, uh, rather than calling them social fascists, maybe Hitler would not have come to power. So the communists analyzed that situation. 1935, they devised a new strategy, which was the Popular Front. And in the case of Spain, that was put into effect. And in 1936, Manuel Asaña, uh, who was a middle class reformer, was elected with the support of the Communist Party, with the support of the socialists. This, uh, the Socialist Party that today is in power in Spain, their uh, origins, their antecedents, was the Socialist Party that supported the Asanya government. But for the Socialists, Asanya wasn't radical enough. And so they withdrew their support. Francisco Largo Caballero, who was a leading member of that Socialist Party, withdrew support for Asanya. And it was at that moment that Franco and three other generals rose up and initiated the Spanish Civil War that led to the triumph of fascism in Spain and Franco being the head of Spain until his death in 1975. So that, those are errors that you pay for in a big way. Um, but I say in this, um, so, you know, the, 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 the comparison with Maduro, I think, uh, uh, helps us at least contextualize what Maduro is doing. In 2018, after he was reelected president, or actually right at the time that he was reelected president, he uh, embarked on a more moderate course. And then in 2020, the anti blockade law, in 2022, the law of La, la Ley de Zonas de Economicas Especiales, um, special economic zones in Paraguaná, Margarita, Puerto Cabello. Uh, including exoneration of, of uh, the sales tax or IVA, impuesto uh, sobre la renta, the, 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 uh, the tax on income, the income tax. So a, a number of concessions were made. Uh, now, uh, I think that there is a comparison that we can make, but a comparison that not only, not only goes back to the 1930s with fascism, but goes back to the very origins of the socialist uh, movement in the world under Marx, uh, because Marx himself, you know, people think of Marx as, you know, this rabid leftist, uh, communist, the revolutions of 1848. But the fact of the matter is that after the defeat of the revolutions of 1848, Marx in the, 19, in the 1850s supported a, a non-offensive, what you might call a defensive strategy, 
because he said that conditions have changed. Europe now has a degree of prosperity. I mean, in other words, he analyzed objective and subjective conditions to reach that conclusion. Not everybody was in agreement with him, and he faced hard resistance. Uh, it was he was uh, considered uh, it was considered a, a heresy, which is a term that Engels used. Um, uh, not not that Engels was against Marx; he was supporting Marx, but saying that other uh, voices in the Communist League, which was Marx's group. Uh, criticized him for that defensive strategy. And the same thing um, with Lenin, you know, uh, Lenin's famous new economic policy. Uh, this was based also on a analysis of objective and subjective conditions, the destruction as a result of the civil war, uh, the destruction of profit property uh, in, in, this, in the Soviet Union. Um, and, but he said, just like in warfare, we don't renounce our basic objectives. We renounce or we change our tactics. That's what he said. Um, uh, and it's necessary to make concessions uh, as a result of the situation internally, but also externally in Europe. Uh, he favored a more defensive strategy uh, with regard to what was happening in the rest of Europe. Well, Zinoviev, Zinoviev uh, Bukharin, Trotsky, they were opposed to that. They favored a more aggressive policy. But Lenin said, you know, the situation in Europe economically has changed. Uh, there's more economic stability, a degree of prosperity. So he took into consideration those objective conditions. He polemicized with uh, Emin Roy at the se second Congress in 2020, in which there was a kind of subtle difference between the two. But Roy favored a more aggressive policy. Lenin thought that this was the time to um, perhaps modify uh, the policy of the international communist movement. So that, um, just to summarize the point I'm trying to make here, and that is that, you know, the critics of Maduro and the critics of Chavez before him, uh, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, when you read their criticism of Maduro and under Chavez, they call themselves Chavistas, they supported Chavez, but they also called for a more radical course. Uh, I remember one uh, leader uh, uh, who said that he was a good friend of Chavez's, um, uh, said that he supported the uh, nationalization of the latifundia, of large corporations, of the banks. Um, but in, in I heard him uh, speak in Barcelona, and it really struck me that there was no mention at all of objective and subjective conditions. Uh, th that was not on the table. And it seems to me that those two factors have to be on the table. They're essential. Uh, the objective conditions uh, being uh, that uh, the uh, war on Venezuela, the sanctions, et cetera, those are objective conditions, but also subjective conditions the uh, state of the Chavista movement, the fact that you don't have the degree of enthusiasm, uh, the degree of mobilization that you had under Chavez. Um, in the 2015 elections, when the opposition made great inroads, the, Chav the opposition took control of the, of the National Assembly, and yet their vote really didn't increase. <coughs> Their vote did not increase in a significant way. The Chavistas lost almost 2 million votes. That was the change. And as a result of that, the opposition gained control of the National Assembly. So those factors have to be taken into consideration. Uh, and uh, that doesn't disqualify the position of the PCV or other parties that are critical of Maduro. They might be right in what they say, but the subjective and but the, the, the analysis has to incorporate objective and subjective conditions into their analysis. I completely agree with you. I mean, especially in, in, in that part, I mean, that, that you have to uh, take into consideration when you are criticizing some liberal decisions <clears throat> taken by Maduro uh, in recent years, 
you have to take into consideration the environment in which those uh, decisions uh, have been taken. So, so, so that's the part that I disagree with the Communist Party of Venezuela. I'm not saying that sometimes uh, I don't agree with some initiatives that the PCV uh, launched. Uh, I agree with that. And I always have been, I have feel sympathetic with the Communist Party of Venezuela. But in recent years, uh, especially, uh, you know, in the middle of this, uh, uh, in fighting with the, with the Maduro government, I've been uh, uh, siding more with the, not with the PSUV, but with Chavismo, with the, with the Maduro decisions, because I understand the the the, the reasons uh, that led to those decisions. So I agree completely with you, and I believe that our compass in the PCV should pay more attention to that. But anyway, that's another discussion. It's more uh, some a more complex issue. But I'm gonna jump to the to the fourth question now. Do you think that it is necessary to clarify among the Western left what imperialism really means in order to properly move forward uh, the anti-imperialist <clears throat> struggle? And I ask you this because there's a lot of conflict in recent years uh, with a lot of people in the north, in the in the le in the in the leftists uh, in the north. Uh, saying that China and Russia are some sort of uh, new new imperialist powers, and uh, we should oppose them, and that's, in my opinion, a big mistake because that, uh, in my opinion, that aims at creating confusion, theoretical confusion among Marxists and a more anti-imperialism. Uh, so, what do you think about that? Yeah, firstly, uh, that position that says that you have many imperialisms, that is the Russian, Chinese, and U.S. imperialisms, they're uh, equally destructive. Um, I think that that is, uh, does a disservice to the solidarity movement throughout the world and the peace movement, because people say that, okay, the United States is imperialist, but so is Russia and China. Uh, the logical conclusion, which a lot of people reach, at least people uh, on the center and the right, and maybe perhaps some people you, you might uh, define as center left, but they, they say, well, okay, I prefer Washington. If the three countries are equally imperialistic, at least Washington is democratic. They're Christian, I should say Roman Christian, because Russia is. Uh, Eastern Orthodox Christian. So, you know, I prefer Washington. I prefer the United States because it's democratic. Um, that glosses over the fact that the United States has 750 military bases throughout the world outside of the United States. That the United States has 250,000 troops stationed in the, at those bases. Um, there's no comparison with regard to China and Russia. Both countries have a military presence at their borders uh, in the South Sea of China, uh, th there's a military presence, but China doesn't have a military presence throughout the world like the United States does. And Russia doesn't either. That's what the Ukraine war is all about, which I don't condone uh, Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. I think it was a, a grave mistake, but it, it was a question of concern for national security and it was a border uh, issue, just like uh, you might compare that with the Cuban Missile Crisis um, of 1962. Not that I'm justifying Kennedy's position there either, but still there's no comparison between those kinds of conflicts and the pivot to Southeast Asia of Obama, which uh, uh, prioritizes, the United States prioritizes our military presence uh, in the Philippines and Australia, etc. So th there's really uh, no comparison there on the military front and on the political front as well. Uh, you know, I mentioned before that the, uh, that the discourse of the foreign, po foreign policy uh, leaders of China and Russia 
is based on a multipolar world, is based on national sovereignty. The discourse of the United States is, is quite different. And those people who say, well, look, Washington, the United States is a democratic nation. Uh, and so there's a difference there um, in terms of what we're trying to do throughout the world. That's what people on the right say, uh, because it's really, really, we're, it's the United States against China and Russia. It's democracy, the, the same Cold War narrative. Uh, it's, about, it's all about democracy. But that overlooks the fact that the fact that the United States is democratic, and that's becoming more and more questionable as time goes on. But still, I mean, the United States does have democratic election, elections. Uh, there are certain, you know, uh, aspects of democracy that isn't present in China and Russia. But nevertheless, historically, that doesn't mean anything. Look at the Russian Empire. Russia, I'm sorry, the Roman Empire. Rome, for its period, was Republican. And yet uh, the Roman Empire had nothing to do with democracy. Um, and throughout history, the, well, the, the British Empire, the same thing. Britain wasn't exporting democracy. It was exporting domination and, he and hegemony. So uh, I think those distinctions have to be made. Um, the, other, the other aspect is economic. Uh, and I would say that uh, the, 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 the globalization theoreticians who say that imperialism is no longer a useful tool to understand understanding what's happening in the world. I say it is just on the political and military front. I mean, what I said before about US imperialist aggression, that really hasn't changed. But in terms of economics, um, you know, uh, David Harvey, who's a Marxist a, a writer who uh, I respect very much, but uh, recently, uh, that's his position. And uh, Arigi, Arigi Tam, uh, also, Giovanni Arigi, who um, uh, says that in the age, or said, he passed away, in the age of globalization, um, the flow associated with imperialism is more complicated and constantly changing direction, I think is, is misleading. Uh, because economically speaking, there is unequal exchange between the North and the South. Um, sure, there are changes, and South Korea is an example of that. It's certainly not the same as it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago, but still you have unequal exchange. The flow is still in the direction of the, of the global North. And although you may say that there's a change taking place, uh, William Robinson has written a lot on transnational capital, what he calls the transnational capitalist class, the, the TCC. Um, and uh, that may be true, that transnational capital is dominant, has become dominant over the recent past. But that doesn't mean that the nation state withers away. He doesn't say that either, but he minimizes the importance of the nation state. And my position is that the nation state uh, in the form of you know, imperialism and in the form of the struggle for national sovereignty. Those territorially based categories can't be minimized. Their importance cannot be minimized. And many of the writers on globalization across the political spectrum, from the left to the right, are, are doing just that. That's true. That's true. And it's terrible anyways, because uh, this creates this... Uh, confusion, in my opinion, that distract us from the most important goal, which is trying to fight imperialism, the real one. But anyway, I believe that the next question relates to that and, and, and is this one. Do you think that petty debates in the Western left distracts many from the main goal that, in my humble opinion, should focus on dismantling capitalism? When I talk about petty debates, I think about these debates about third worldism, environmentalism, nationalism, colonialism. I, I'm not trying to minimize the importance of those debates, but I believe, or the or the or or the factual uh, uh, or the factuality of of those things of those phenomena. But I believe that the main thing here to discuss is 
fighting against capitalism. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, I, I would prefer to formulate the issue <clears throat> along different lines, because I think that the differences on the left uh, are understandable. And they reflect the complexity and the contradictions of the capitalist system. In the United States, uh, the organized left is basically divided in three general categories or tendencies. Uh, the left that is struggling against imperialism, that prioritizes the struggle against imperialism. The left that is centered on what some people call identity politics, having to do with gender and race and issues that relate to that. And um, the left that focuses on the working class and domestic economic issues. So you have three different categories. And those three different categories reflect <clears throat> different, uh, a different social base that um, there are different perceptions that ultimately have to do uh, with class differences or social differences. There's an intersectionality in terms of these three issues coming together at certain points. But also there are differences with regard to emphasis, uh, discourse, uh, and priorities. I'll give you one example. Um, uh, about six months ago, I was um, uh, in Washington and I went to a protest uh, that was called the Rage, Rage Against the War in Washington, D.C., in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And uh, I, I went there to check it out, really, but I, I kind of got uh, enthusiastic about it because um, I liked the, uh, the, uh, most of the presentations. But that, that protest was very controversial because it was an attempt to bring those sectors of the right <clears throat> that are opposed to the war in Ukraine and are opposed to war, at least the military budget uh, in general, uh, together. And the argument was, you know, the war movement is, is so weak, at least if you compare it with the anti-war movement in the 60s, uh, it's small. It's very small, even though, you know, what's happening today is, you know, just as bad, if not worse than the war in Vietnam, or at least let's say just as bad. Um, so uh, that, that uh, protest uh, brought a lot of criticism because there were speakers there and there were people who sponsored that protest. Uh, Ron Paul was one of them. <clears throat> and the widow of the notorious Lyndon LaRouche, who was a, a right winger, um, sponsored, supported, and some of them participated in the protest. Uh, and many people, you know, felt that, you know, these are people who are opposing uh, uh, the rights of the working class, the reactionaries, which they are, uh, they are reactionaries on issues of race, gender, and the working class. And you can't, you can't write that off. You can't say, these are questions of principle. You can't say, well, okay, they're good on some things and bad on others. When, you, when it comes to racism, for instance, there's no um, equilibrium. There's no way to balance things off. Um, so these are not easy issues. And I would say that <clears throat> I, I, I understand where, where you're coming from, when you use the term petty um, debates, sometimes they seem petty. But I think that the starting point, the, the point of departure uh, in the discussion has to be a recognition that these differences are legitimate and they have their explanation. It's not that one sector is right and the other sector is wrong, or it's not that one sector is more leftist than the other. It's that there, these are differences, objective differences, and they're not going to go away. Um, you know, uh, my, my article in Science of Society made reference to Mao's famous uh, work, actually two works, on contradictions among the people, in which he says you've got to make a distinction <clears throat> between primary fundamental contradictions with the enemy and contradictions among the people. And those contradictions among the people are resolved through debate, discussion, and he didn't use this term, but um, through a... Um, through comprehension uh, and uh, a rejection of sectarianism. And I think that that's really uh, the, the, the issue of sectarianism. There are groups that are sectarian that don't want to have anything to do or uh, write off other groups 
that are coming from different directions. Um, and I think that that mentality has to be overcome. That's a good point. That's a good point. I still believe that, the, I mean, uh, talking about going to the to the issue of the war against the machine protests, I agree with you that that there was uh, a lot of unnecessary criticism, especially amongst close friends of us uh, that didn't want to participate in, in in that demonstration that in my opinion was a mistake because uh, at least in that particular issue of war and, uh, you know, earth annihilation, uh, one has to think broadly than than you know the petty spaces the small spaces that each one defends so in that particular case i believe that it was absolutely necessary to to unite for the common goal of trying to avoid a, a nuclear catastrophe related to the war in ukraine so i agree with you in that but i also believe that 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 sometimes there, are, especially in the north, that doesn't happen too much here in the south. But in the north, there are too many groups that, in my opinion, waste too much energy. I'm not criticizing them uh, uh, as a whole, but uh, they waste too much energy uh, in those small debates, uh, and and that this, in my opinion, distract people from the main goal especially Marxist, uh, socialist people, which, in, uh, in my humble opinion, should be, you know, trying to fight against capitalism, try to change who owns the means of production, how, you know, try to do that. But anyway, it's a complex debate. I understand that. I'm going to jump to the next question. Do you think that it is really relevant for the world to pay too much attention to the U.S. presidential elections, talking about the upcoming uh, 2024 U.S. presidential elections, when any change in the White House uh, doesn't really mean a significant change in U.S. imperialism. You already talked a little bit about that earlier, but anyway, I mean, the question was there, and I believe that is relevant, especially in front of the upcoming elections. Yeah, uh, you know, Biden is now, in the last uh, month or so, trying to project himself as more leftist or more progressive on domestic issues, <clears throat> which is a half truth. But, uh, you know, just a few days ago, he joined the picket uh, of the UAW, the automobile workers who were on strike, and, and he went to Michigan to uh, join them. Um, but on the, inter on the international issues, uh, <clears throat> he's more disappointing than, than Obama. Obama had a very bad position on Venezuela, but he did uh, uh, have two important initiatives with regard to Cuba and, and Iran. Um, I, I personally, if I had to choose between the Democrats and Republicans, um, firstly, I don't really see much in the way of differences on foreign policy. Sometimes the Republicans may take a, a moderately better position than the Democrats. Like in the case of Ukraine, there are a number of Republicans who are opposed to um, uh, allocations uh, for the military budget for uh, Ukraine. Uh, so sometimes, and, and Trump had a better position on North Korea, <laughs> seemed to be, to have gotten on pretty good terms uh, with that government. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, the two are equally bad, uh, equally imperialistic. Uh, I don't see that much in the way of differences, maybe in, the, in terms of discourse, but not in terms of action. But I, I personally favor, uh, you know, if, if I had to choose, I would prefer that the Democrats win the presidential elections over the Republicans only, but, but not because they have a better position on foreign policy, but because they, they do have uh, a better position on domestic economic issues, even though that leaves a lot to be desired, and that's an, that can't be emphasized enough. But they provide the left uh, with a certain degree of impetus, and sectors of the left or sectors of the progressive movement, what we might call the central left or progressives, those sectors have fairly good positions on foreign policy. 
So that I think that that would be an argument for saying that the uh, the but you know the left in general uh, over the last uh, couple of years has become disillusioned with the Democratic Party. It's a left that attempted to work within the Democratic Party. Don't don't forget that, that Bernie Sanders, that movement uh, had a lot of traction in 2016 and even more so in 2020 in the sense that um, he had already built up a following by 2020. Uh, and the largest party, the largest organized group uh, on the left here in the United States, uh, I say here in the United States, I mean Venezuela, but in the United States is the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, and they grew uh, in large part because they designed a strategy of working within the Democratic Party in favor of progressive candidates and socialist candidates um, uh, such as Bernie Sanders. Uh, but their last convention was in August uh, in Chicago. And uh, uh, the leftist tendency within the Democratic, or tendencies within the Democratic, the DSA, the Democratic Social America, uh, seemed to be become more or less dominant uh, or stronger than other tendencies. Uh, and their position questions very much working within the Democratic Party or at least emphasizing, prioritizing work within the Democratic Party. There, there are two, uh, at least two candidates uh, who are, in my mind, anti-imperialist. One is Colonel West, who's a candidate for the Green Party. I don't know if he uses the term uh, imperialism, but he definitely has an anti-imperialist discourse. He's been around for some time. Uh, he supported Biden in 2020, and now he's a candidate, a presidential candidate. Um, uh, and he's much better than Howie Harkins, who was the candidate of the Green Party in 2020. Uh, Jill Stein was better than, than Hawkins on, on, on imperialism. Um, but uh, he's one candidate. And, and I think the other candidate is being uh, supported because she's a socialist. Her name is Claudia de la Cruz. And she uh, is a I don't know if she belongs to, but she uh, is a candidate of the Party of Socialism and Liberation. Uh, and they are socialist. So I think that some people uh, are saying, well, we should support a socialist and not a non-socialist like, like West. Uh, I personally feel that there should be an attempt to come together. And if it's a candidate who's not a socialist, but is anti-imperialist, then that candidate should be supported. Um, but like I said before, there is a growing tendency to reject the Democratic Party uh, of people, not only on issues of imperialism, but also on internal issues, on domestic issues that want to go beyond the Democratic Party. That's true. So do you think, I mean, who do you think is going to win then? <laughs> I mean, uh, in, the, in the 2024, uh, in, the, in the next year elections in the U.S.? Well, I, I don't think that Trump is going to win. That, that's all I can say. I don't know okay. about the other candidates, but the uh, percentage, the rejection uh, percentages for Trump works against him because none of the candidates have an absolute majority. Uh, and if they're just two major candidates, they're going to need 50% or close to 50% of the vote. And uh, Trump doesn't have much to look for. I mean, he's got a solid base within the Republican Party. But outside of the Republican Party, I, I don't see any strategy on his part that will rein in um, other sectors of the population, like the independents. Uh, so the Democrats, as bad as they may be, and Biden is a very unattractive candidate, even going beyond political issues, just in terms of, of uh, his um, lack of charisma, to say the least. Uh, but I think that uh, the Democrats have more of a chance of attracting the vote of independence than Trump would have. Good point, good point. Let's jump to the last question because I really were already past our timing. Uh, and this is the one. You have closely followed the process of change in Venezuela under Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. What are the lessons that you would like to share with us about uh, you know, your analysis on, on these times, recent times, the last two decades in Venezuela. 
Well, Jesus, firstly, I want to say that any criticism that I have of the Maduro government is tentative. Uh, and I say that because, as I've argued above, uh, Venezuela is in the crosshairs of Washington. Uh, and subjective and objective conditions have to be taken into consideration. Uh, there is no way of knowing. There's no scientific way of knowing, or at least I don't have any instrument to ascertain just how far the Chavista government can go without opening the possibility for the opposition to uh, destabilizing the country even, for, even more and gaining power. And if that happens, liquidating the Chavistas. Uh, either through a Pinochet-type repression or soft, and I say that in, parenthes in quotation marks, uh, soft forms of repression that is imprisonment and, and exile as opposed to more violent methods. So I, th I think that the, uh, the corruption within PDVSA that it has been revealed recently um, is really somewhat of a, should be a, a wake up call uh, in the sense that it really begs for an analysis of what went on, what went on within Pedavesa. And it dates back to the uh, presidency of Rafael Ramirez, uh, who was president of Pedavesa during those, during those years. And uh, what happened with Pedavesa in the years following that, he has a great degree of responsibility uh, not only because of what was happening while he was president of PDVSA, but also the things that were in place, policies and a structure that was in place that continued after he left uh, PDVSA. Um, and I think that what really becomes evident uh, at a first glance is that Ramirez was president of PDVSA, but he was also at the same time minister of, of uh, petroleum and mining. Uh, and that, I think, is a mistake because it uh, negates the possibility of checks and balances, the principle of checks and balances. In Spanish, it's, you know, poder y contra poderes, uh, equilibrio, and that's indispensable. And in my opinion, should not be confused or conflated with bourgeois democracy, which dates back to Chavez. I mean, when Chavez was president, his support for social controllership, uh, la contraloria social, the idea that the people themselves would organize at the local level in order to monitor and denounce uh, mis misdeeds, corruption, and uh, erroneous policies. That uh, was at an incipient stage. There wasn't enough of a culture here in Venezuela for that to think that that would replace uh, the system of checks and balances. So it seems to me that, you know, and my, 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 my criticism, my basic criticism actually, is that there has to be in place a system of checks because the people in power can be uh, the most dedicated and committed people in the world. But if there is no other um, uh, entity that will monitor what they're doing and that has an input in what they're doing, uh, then there is going to be an abuse of power or at least in the best of cases, you know, erroneous policies that will take place. Um, and those checks and balances, that, that, that concept that I have of checks and balances goes beyond just uh, state institutions, like what I mentioned before, about uh, the Ministry of Oil uh, and or Mr. Ministry of Petroleum and the state oil company, PDVSA. For instance, the party itself, the, the PESUVE. I, I believe that the PESUVE uh, should consist of a leadership that is outside of the state to a great extent. Now, the president of PESUVE has always been the president of Venezuela, Chavez and Maduro, and I don't see anything bad about that. But it seems to me that there has to be um, individuals high up in the party, uh, the vice presidents of the party, for instance, who should be uh, party members first and anything else second. Uh, it's a mistake to have ministers and governors occupying those top positions under Maduro 
uh, within the structure of the of the Pesuve. And just uh, a final note, and that is, you know, you mentioned the case of the Partido Comunista de Venezuela, and uh, I think that the checks and balances have a lot to do with the strategy of alliances, because when a governing party is allied with other parties, that also serves as a kind of a check on those who are in power. And under Chavez, you had that. You had the um, Polo Patriotico, which Chavez called a historical bloc, a concept that goes back to Gramsci. Um, and uh, it seems to me that when that was more or less uh, eliminated, although it still exists, El Polo Patriotico, but in effect, it, it, it doesn't have the importance that it had before. I think that um, you lost out on this possibility of having loyal allies or loyal critics that could, you know, uh, criticize and open for constructive criticism and debate. Um, now, the strategy when the government talks about alliances, they're talking about alliances with, for instance, business people. Uh, and that, that is certainly important now that Fede Communist leaders are denouncing sanctions. Uh, I see nothing wrong about that. But that strategy is to neutralize. It's not a strategy of, of allies, or at least strategic allies. It's to neutralize uh, Fede Communist, to a certain extent, the church as well. Uh, these aren't going to be strategic allies. They're going to be people who are, who are criticizing less than they did before. So I think the concept of checks and balances is crucial for uh, any government of the left in power. I agree with you. I agree with you with that. I mean, especially, I mean, in, in the question of, in the issue of corruption, but also in the issue of how you counterbalance that corruption with strong institutions within the state, but also with uh, the last thing that you say about alliances with with other parties is complex anyway to I mean to I, 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 what I'm trying to say is that I don't see it easily that that can happen easily in these current times in Venezuela especially that part of the of the alliances with other parties but I believe that it is necessary I believe that that eventually we will reach certain atmosphere or environment in Venezuela that will allow that to happen again or to really happen because we also have even during Chavez time this uh, uh, charisma arrollador we say in Spanish that uh, uh, I don't know how to say it in English but Chavez charisma there that was too powerful that even you know within this political alliance like the great great a patriotic poll uh, uh, was too big to anyway to to sometimes make that counterbalance that you are talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but I believe that we need that. I mean, uh, it's necessarily. I don't see it at this moment, but uh, I believe that it, we should work to make that happen. That's absolutely true. So thank you uh, for accepting our interview, Steve. I really enjoy it. I don't know if you want to say a few words because closing the interview. Well, uh, just that uh, what I said before about the tentative nature of criticism, there are some people in the United States and probably in Europe who say that it's not valid uh, to criticize you know, countries of the South or countries in which the left is in power uh, um, that, you know, we're, we should be working to oppose the sanctions and working against imperialism. And that's basically what they're saying, although not in these words, that's none of our business. <laughs> that's basically what they say. I have always disagreed with that. Um, in fact, that uh, I think it was at the left forum, uh, that issue came up once. Uh, I've always disagreed with that because I think that these are lessons to be learned. But I do want to emphasize uh, that uh, these are tentative criticisms. Perhaps there are other criticisms that are not tentative, but these are tentative criticisms because they really have a lot to do with just what is feasible at this particular moment. 
And of course, things change. And so what's feasible today isn't necessarily feasible tomorrow. That's true. That's true. And I agree with you, with you in that part of, you know, being critic the, uh, because I also love to, especially in our Inoko Tribune, we try to be critics of what happened in the left movement in the North also that we, uh, I believe that we in the South also have the right to criticize the things that we from the South value as questionable from the you know from the attitude of the left in the north so i believe that's absolutely necessary i mean that that criticism should happen both ways uh, yeah. because especially because people in the north tend to believe that they are perfect uh, <laughs> and i believe that that, that that's something related to ra racism but but that's a big uh, another big di discussion but uh we need to do that. We need to uh, to, especially in a to do make criticism in the in a constructive approach, in an approach trying to make things better in the other side. Yeah. So this is not to not to question what you said about the uh, element of racism, but to um, say that uh, that's true what you say. But in addition to that, it uh, really strikes my attention. Uh, discussions among people on the left in the United States that look to Latin America as an inspiration. Uh, because in fact, Latin America is really alone in the world in spite of the crisis of capitalism from an economic viewpoint and in terms of a legitimacy crisis, uh, the right has made further gains than the left uh, over the last several decades. Uh, and only in Latin America do you have a situation of progressive governments, center-left and leftist governments that have come to power and really without parallel, uh, because, you know, you have Samuel Huntington talked about waves, democratic waves, and there were waves in which Democrats and leftists came to power after World War II, in the early 1960s, different waves in the 1980s, uh, but nothing like the so-called pink tide of the 21st century. And it looked like in 2015, that that was coming to an end. And I remember uh, Jorge Castaneda saying, you know, look, uh, it's all over for the left uh, because Macri was elected and a series of other defeats took place. But then beginning with Lopez Obrador and then the elections in Bolivia, um, there was a turnaround. And uh, really uh, for people in the North, that feel so isolated. I mean, the left is isolated and it has been really, at least since the 1930s and 40s. Um, they view Latin America as an inspiration uh, and a well-deserved inspiration of that. That's true. I agree with you with that. Un abrazo, Steve, and thank you again. Okay. Be safe, please. Okay.